Welcome to the High Performance Hockey Podcast. Today, we're joined by the assistant coach of the Cleveland Monsters, Mark Letestu. Mark played in more than 800 games over a 13-year pro career, including 255 contests in the American Hockey League. In 2018-19, Mark served as an alternate captain with the Monsters and finished second on the team in scoring. Mark played 567 games in the National Hockey League with the Pittsburgh Penguins, Columbus Blue Jackets, Edmonton Oilers, and Winnipeg Jets. He is currently the assistant coach in the American Hockey League with the Cleveland Monsters. We wanted to speak to Mark today about his career, his transition into coaching, the mentors that he's looked up to, what he looks for, what he's looked at throughout his career in good coaches, period, whether it's a performance coach or a head coach. And finally, his advice to young hockey players and hockey parents. It's a fantastic episode. Had the opportunity to work with Mark for three years late in his career. I learned probably just as much as hopefully Mark did. It's a fantastic episode. Welcome to the podcast. Welcome to the podcast, Mark. Thanks so much for joining us. Hey, buddy. Thanks for having me. Always good to see you. Absolutely. It's uh, long overdue. Excited for our talk. Number one, we're dear friends, but uh, I've always had a ton of admiration for you both on and off the ice. Currently, I want to fast forward to the current moment right now. First year coach in the American Hockey League with the Cleveland Monsters. Transitioning from player to coach. How has that been? Is, is, has there been challenges? You know, you've played a, a, almost 800 games of professional hockey. Have you taken a lot of those lessons and learned along the way? Or, you know, what are the struggles for a first year coach? Well, you're constantly learning. I think that's the the first part about it. The players, it's funny enough, now you're on the other side. They sniff out somebody that doesn't know what they're talking about or somebody that's selling them something you don't necessarily believe in. But it's been a quick transition. And even, I guess, to take you through it, I wasn't even supposed to be the assistant coach this year. I had taken the job as development coach. I was going to be kind of working with drafted prospects and you know the world, COVID, and all that kind of stuff. It just opened up an opportunity And over my previous years with coaches I've worked with, they've always kind of said, you make a good coach. You know, you take that for what that's worth when somebody tells you that. It's a compliment, but you don't necessarily know why. So this opportunity with the Monsters opened up and, you know, I I jumped at it just wanting to stay in the game. And it's turned out to be a a really good opportunity for me. Not only that I get, get to stay home and near my family in Ohio, but to have a colleague and colleagues, I should say, Trent Vogelhuber, you know, another Ohio younger than I am, but you know, the way hockey works, he's been in the game three years longer than me. So he's somebody I look to look up to bounce ideas off of. And then, you know, Mike Eves, who's, who's coached for a you know hell of a long time. And as you know, in hockey and in business and in life, if you've been doing something a long time it tends to be, means you're pretty good at it. So to have him in the locker room and somebody as a source of knowledge and somebody to pick at, it's helped. You know, I'm only 23 games in, I'm running the defense, which never played. So it's been, uh, it's been a learning experience. It's been a lot of fun. But again, very, very, very f- first few steps here, this long journey, I hope. Absolutely. Um, you know, you talked a little bit about mentors and coaches. Who are the coaches that you feel you've pulled from over your career now as a coach? Uh, you know, absorb, possibly modify and apply that message. But who are some of the, the mentors that you looked up to and now aspire, you know, towards starting your coaching career? You're certainly taking something from everybody. And I know that's a, that's a very generic response. That doesn't mean you're always taking good from everybody. I've had bad experience with coaches. I've had good experiences. You know, I think to more recently, Paul Maurice and Todd McClellan, some of my more recent coaches were very good at explaining why yeah. there wasn't so much just to do it because I said, so it was more of a, we do this and this is the result. And this is why you're going to be successful. And I, I found, and I got that later in my career when I was a much more mature athlete and, and maybe was starved for the why more than just being told what to do, but it, it all clicked for me. It made sense. They were coaches and they were, they'd, they'd been doing it a long time. And again, if anybody's been doing something a long time, they're usually good at it. You could see why they were good at it. They had a way of explaining it tactically, but then showing you the purpose for it and why it would work within a system. And, and I really respected that that part of teaching the game to players. And then I guess, you know, for me personally, and a lot of athletes, my dad, Oh wow. he, wa- he wasn't necessarily my coach on the ice and behind the bench, but 
there was always an opportunity to coach me in the drive home, you know, and then it wasn't always, uh, <laughs> it was it wasn't always a nice drive. Yeah. Uh, I had many of those, but, <laughs> I had many yeah. of those drives, <laughs> but the one thing that I took from him was the, uh, unbiased honesty, you know, the way sure. you would talk wow. to your son, how you care for them and you want their success. They give it to you straight. You didn't like maybe hearing what they had to say, but they didn't mind hurting your feelings if you were bad and they didn't mind, you know, boosting your confidence when you're good, but you got it straight. And I think that's something as a coach you hope to do for your players. They may not always like the way they hear it or what they hear, but they respect you for giving them the truth in those moments. Unbiased honesty. How, how fantastic is that? It actually reminds me of my father as well. And, and it, it reminds me a lot of the great coaches that I had along the way. Communication is so critical in those moments because you have to know that that individual is coming at you because they care. You know, the communication, the delivery of that message is very important. Yeah. And I think I, I, you know, with the re, the newer athlete, you can't just tell them what to do now. You can't just bark at them and yell and, and holler and tell them to do things harder. For me, you have to give them a roadmap to what they find is their success. Okay. You want to get to the NHL. This is how we're going to get there. And sometimes you have to tell them you care about them. You have to, they, it's, it's just a, a modern, in my opinion, anyways, that wasn't the relationship with your coach when I came up. They were your coach. They were your superior. You did what you were told. It wasn't so much a partnership as it was a hierarchy. And now as, as players and coaches go along, there's more of a partnership. You have to, in my opinion, you have to convey that their success is my success. And therefore I care about you and I care about how you do. So this is why I'm giving you the, the information you need. Well, it leads right next to our next question. Rather, you talked about this difference between, you know, you and I, I guess would be considered Gen X, right? And millennials. How have you crafted your message differently? Has it, I mean, obviously, I would imagine it's more of a cooperative approach as opposed to a directive approach in the professional ranks. And has technology interplayed with that as well? Now there's a tech piece of tech for everything. So how do you communicate to that millennial type athlete? Well, and, and I, I would imagine a more veteran coach would be able to give you a, a better diagram of, you know, this is what it was like 10 years ago to, to five years ago to now. This is, this is my first athletes I'm working with, but I, I've been in locker rooms over that period of time and the need for video, the need for confirmation in what they're doing seems to be more and more. The older player, in my view, would be able to sit on the bus and know their shifts almost throughout the whole game and know the way they played. And you could draw back on your memory because that's really all you had. There wasn't, a, you know, the access to video they have now. I mean, you're watching an NHL game. There's TVs now underneath the coach's feet. So anytime you see after a goal and the co coaches are looking down, that's what they're looking at. They're watching the replay of the goal. And it's almost an instantaneous, oh, it was this your, it was your man. This was the breakdown. This is why it happened. Whereas before, I mean, even when you probably played college, you know, you didn't get to that till the next day. Literally, you know, they broke yeah. down the video. So now guys can get instantaneous video of the last shift. I don't necessarily think it's good or bad, but it's changing. So they're, they're for, for me as a coach, I have to find a lot of times evidence for why I want changes in their game because they need it. If, if they don't see the results based on what I'm telling them or they don't have the evidence, it's, it's much more difficult for me to get them to buy it. I would imagine social media comes in a lot with the younger players, uh, Twitter, Instagram, everything you can imagine. I had the opportunity to work with you for the for three years, and I know that you weren't a social media person in terms of having a Twitter account. From a personal standpoint, why didn't you have one? Did it did it did it affect your game, or did you not even want it to go there? Yeah, I I view it as poison. I, I do. I, I think social media is a poison, and that's not to say that there's there's not benefits from it. Yep. You know, a lot of people promote charities and charity work and maybe bring attention to causes that are worthy. But I just found as an athlete, that's generally not what it was used for for me. For me, it ended up, I ended up in people's mentions and very rarely was it positive. You know, I was taking somebody's, I was taking somebody's spot on the power play. I was too slow. I was, and for me, the, the more I read it, the more you believe it. And it, to me, it's wow. just natural as a person. You know, and that's not to say I was an insecure or non-confident player, but when the noise, all you hear is that it's bad, it's bad, it's slow, it's, you know, he doesn't deserve this or belong here. 
for me, it's just there's a natural tendency for that kind of to creep into your psyche. And when you play at the highest level, for me, the ego and the confidence is something that needs to drive you. You need to believe that you can do everything that you think you can do at a high level. It just helps it along. And when you have doubt, you know, that probably creates some things in your game and in your confidence. You know, you hear players talk about it all the time. Uh, it just causes, you know, deficiencies in your game. So for me, I just like to cut out the noise. And that's that I, not that I didn't want to hear any criticism. It didn't have to be, but I wanted criticism from the people that were important to me, not wow. the bots and the, the people, you know, my family, my teammates, my coaches, that's my circle. And those are the people that they have my phone number. They want to criticize. They can call me. You know, it's not an anonymous thing. And they have my phone number because I respect them and I respect their opinions. So those are the people I let criticize. And, and, and if I needed the boost, they'd give me the boost as well. Well put. Well put, Mark. Coaching and evaluating players. Obviously, again, speaking about, I know it's, you know, 23 games into your coaching career, but what are three qualities that you see? And it doesn't have to be three. How does an American League player get to that next level? What are the qualities? Is it playing his his role? Is it is it speed? What are the qualities that you see that really separate players or get that opportunity to get their crack in the National Hockey League? Yeah, I think talent always gets them in the door. I think that gets them their first look. It probably gets them drafted. It gets them on the team. I think talent can take you a long ways. It, it certainly can. After that, to me, it's it's the preparation. And the preparation comes from practice habits. You're away from the rink habits. The, the little things that go unseen to me. So your talent, your preparation, that's all making your skills better. And then you need some luck. And, yeah. you know, I've had this discussion with some of the players in the room. For me, luck is opportunity plus preparation. So there's not a lot of guys that get an opportunity. There's a lot of talented players that get an opportunity, but maybe they didn't take care of themselves or prepare the proper way to, to take advantage of it. They're going to get that one game, make a good impression, they get a second game. Make a good impression for a week, now they get 10 games. And to me, that's where the, the preparation comes from, is it's, it's habits, day in, day out. It's taking care of your body. It's getting your sleep. It's knowing your systems, it's having your passport on the road. So if you get called up, like there's just little things. It's about being a pro that when you get that opportunity, you can make the most of it and tell, you know, leave no doubt that you did what you could. I'd imagine there's a tremendous monotony. You know, you've played 800 professional games from pregame meals to taping your stick to preparation. You got to find a way to embrace that monotony if you want to be, if you want to try to reach that level, correct? Yeah, I think you got to love it. You got to love it. You know, you don't have to love chicken and pasta 82 times a year, but I think the grind of it all, the bad makes the good that much better. You know, the grind of training camp and the grind of a summer without sugar and alcohol and, you know, like all, all the things that, you know, maybe you said no to that would have been a hell of a lot of fun. You can get your fill when you get Stanley Cup at the end. You can go nuts. So I think the sacrifice is necessary for that good at the end. It's it's all worth it to anybody who's ever pursued something like that. Well put. Okay, so I, off note here, Mick, Connor McDavid, come on. Like the guy, you had the opportunity to play with him. I think he's the best player in the world right now. What makes him so special? I know he's touched by the hand of God. I know, but are there any things that, anything that you said, hey, wow, just just unbelievable and in awe of uh whether it be off ice or on ice that you had the opportunity to, to, to witness firsthand. Well, he's, he's special. I mean, you yeah. just highlight reel. It's, he needs another league. Yeah. <laughs> uh, his ability for his hands and brain to work as fast as his feet do to me is special. Everything is at such a high speed. And when we talk about, you know, all the things I laid out here for your American league player, well, you know, his talent is, is off the charts. You know, he's just, he's so fast and gifted and he moves right. He's got the right body for it. He's got everything. You yep. know, like you said, he's been touched, but his preparation. And I mean, his preparation probably started at 13, you know, when people knew who he was and what he was going to be, he's taken every step to get better. Does that mean that his curve still wouldn't have put him in the top, you know, 50 players in the NHL? Probably, you know, his talent probably would have taken him there, but his preparation for, you know, and his passion and everything. I think that puts him at the top. He, yeah. he hasn't let, uh, hasn't wasted it. He hasn't squandered it. Um, and if, if you've ever seen him do an interview, he's an incredible ambassador for the game. So I was, I was a lot, very lucky 
to be in the same locker room and share his first three years in the league. And uh, he's, he's a lot of fun to watch. Well, I'm going to pivot here for a second. I want to talk a little bit more now about not so much on the ice, but I want to talk about you as a player, specifically your preparation process. So close to 600 games in the National Hockey League. Regarding that time in the NHL, speak with me from a performance coach standpoint. You don't need to mention names, but what did you feel made a really good performance coach, strength and conditioning coach during your experience in your in your time in the National Hockey League? Well, I think, again, you talk about being in the game for a long time. It has given me maybe time to reflect on it. When you're first in the league, you're just going to do what the guy says. You know, like it, yeah. I mean, you just don't want to attract any attention. You're just going to do it and, and move on. So you don't really think about it. But as, as your career goes on, you know, for me, the, the most important thing now is, is the flexibility and program for the individual. You know, my, my body type, my needs are so much different from the other 18 guys in the room. And I found sometimes ego got in the way with, with some strength coaches. You know, and one of the best situations I seen was the end of my career in Winnipeg where not necessarily the other strength coaches were allowed in the room, but other players were allowed to continue their programs from the summer in, in Winnipeg in season. And it, there was no ego involved. It wasn't, well, I'm the Winnipeg strength coach. So you got to do my stuff. They kind of allowed guys to, to manage themselves and they always showed up in shape and they're always healthy. And there was a bit of a mutual trust there between the player and the strength coach. And it seemed to work. Everybody was happy. There was no infighting, and it just seemed for me to be a very cooperative thing. Uh, but sometimes with the competitive nature of pro sports and limited amount of jobs, sometimes they don't really want to share that. So for me, the, the, the specialization for individuals and the allowing for people to kind of explore things, for me, was, was really Im impressive, I think, towards the end of my career that they finally realized not everybody's the same. You know, sure. I'm, I'm not going to get the same benefits as Sidney Crosby. It's just yeah. not going to happen. And I think confidence is so, it's so important with programming as well. You know, the idea that whether the program works or not, if you believe it, that's probably one of the most important qualities, right? The, the perception of the program might be more important than the actual program itself. So at that, at that point, you want to put egos aside and, and, and continue to educate the athlete, but allow them to, to be able to, to take control in a cooperative approach. Yeah, and I think, I think empowering them. Given yes. them a, an opportunity to contribute to it. I don't think, uh, you know, maybe you know, I was never a, a front squat guy. I could do them, but I just, I didn't like them. And, you know, if you have a trainer that's willing to work with you and, you know, he's not, wow, you know, front squats are the way to go and this is the optimal way. So you got to get to torque your wrists and do whatever you want. And, but, you know, to have somebody, you know, we'll, we'll make adjustments, empower them a little bit, give them some work. But at the same time, you know, there's, naturally the athlete sometimes wants to make it easier. Not everybody is sure, you know, stone cold killer and wants the hardest workouts. So it also takes a strength coach to know too, when, when maybe I'm taking a Liberty and you're like, ah, we got to do some front squats today. So it, there's, there's a little bit of give and take and, and some trust involved. And I think when there's a good relationship, there's, there's usually a good result to the program. Besides ego, were there qualities that you felt detracted from a good performance coach? specifically, especially towards the tail end of your career. I know we've had a big technology boom, whether it's monitoring, whether it's load management. I know there's a lot now in all sports, not just ice hockey, of course, but there's a lot of emphasis on measure and objectifying. Thoughts on that towards the tail end of your career? Did you value those metrics? Were they communicated to you? Did you feel that they helped, hindered? For... <laughs> And funny enough, I, the way I bounced around in my career, I never got to work with, with a strength coach for a huge portion of my career. I got blocks of time. And, and I, I say that because I think those metrics and those numbers matter in a large sample size. I think you can give me numbers. You know, you and I work together for one summer and I can have good numbers. I can have bad numbers, but, I, but we really don't know because it's one year. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then you go the second year, you, you can compare the numbers, but you're like, hmm, maybe one of these years are an outlier. Maybe I'm ahead. Maybe I'm not. F for me, all the, all the data, I would like a decade of it. You know, I would like to see 10 years of here's the numbers, you know, for, for me, that's when it starts to make sense. And because it doesn't make sense for me, you know, I, I worked out with the Sherwood boys in, in Ohio there. 
it didn't make sense for any of my numbers to match theirs. We were different athletes, different ages. So that the comparison between athletes gets dicey with numbers, but year to year, you know, July 1st and from 2015 then 2016 and 2017 and 2018, to me, that's when the, the numbers become tangible. Sure. And that's when they, that's when they really show value. So I would say, yeah, they're, they're fun. You know, you can show all the athletes, all the bells and whistles, and we do fancy things and we monitor your sleep. But if you don't have a big enough sample size to then adjust things to make the numbers maybe fit better, it, it doesn't, for me, hold a lot of weight. Certainly. So longitudinal data, data year over year, specifically you compared to you, which is very difficult to do in, in, in any pro sport, just because of the, the, the athletes being traded, being released, whatever it may be. Interesting. Exactly. How, just curious again, off script question, but did you find it again, this would be more towards the end of your career. Was the communication pretty streamlined with the technology? Did the most players get buy-in or was this something that was more of a nuisance in locker rooms? Did you feel like it added to the decision-making? We did a lot of force plate stuff in Edmonton, a little bit in Columbus. I didn't spend a lot of time at the end in Columbus uh, with the force plate stuff. Maybe did one or two jumps because I came after the deadline. But we did three years in Edmonton, and they were always very open with what they were using it for. I know in one, in one specific case, we had a player with an ACL surgery. So they went and took his force plate data from the two years previous, and then had, throughout his rehab, were able to use the force plate to show that that he wasn't compensating as much or his knee strength was there. So there, there was value in it. And honestly, you're doing three jumps, I don't know, a couple times a month. It's really a, a low impact, low nuisance. There really wasn't a big cost to us that way, especially related to rehab situations. There, there seemed to be really, really beneficial stuff for us as players. And at least a number we could see when they tell you, well, you're not ready. Like, well, what do you mean I'm not ready? I feel great. You know, because you get to that window, okay, you're 12 months out maybe on ACL. And you get to that 10 month, and you're like, I feel awesome. What do you mean I can't play? I feel great. And they're like, well, he can't play. And you're thinking it's just a doctor sticking to his timeline. But if you have tangible, you know, your bi- like your bio, biologically, you are not, you're still not pushing off your left knee. Right? And we can show you right here, this is why you're not playing. It makes more sense to a player and it takes out some of the frustration and the disconnect with management or training staff. So well, so well put. And 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 you see that why it's being used. I think you know, for me now looking at, looking at the testing battery for us, I mean, I always want to say what what's the least wear and tear on the athlete? What's the best narrative I can give the athlete? And and can I use the actual test for return to play measure should the athlete get injured? I think all those if if you if we're able to check those boxes and then obviously be able to communicate the why behind it. Your testing essentially is your return to play. So testing is training, training is testing. Yeah. And I, again, I think it eliminates the, sometimes the frustration that comes from the player side. And then with the frustration comes the distrust comes that I don't want to do your program come I mean, there's yep. a whole can of worms. So I think anytime you can explain yourself and this is why we do it, it's not invasive. I, I think players will certainly buy in. But teams are always looking for an advantage. That's the thing. So the new wristwatch, headband, whatever, to measure something, uh, it, it's going to continue to be introduced. And hopefully they find more ways to apply it to our game that, that make it beneficial for players. In-season versus off-season. Uh, we talk a lot of times in the performance community, community, excuse me, as you know, this is a management time, meaning in-season. You got 82 games in the season versus a development time in the off-season. You know, from a physical standpoint, when you look back at your career in season wise, I realize every situation was different, but in terms of the actual lifting, was it after practice? Was it all dependent on game schedule? How many touch points a week did you typically get in the National Hockey League? Well, and again, you're you're talking about the the script of the week would play out differently. Typically, if it was a lighter week, we'd get into the gym a couple of times, always dictated by the strength coach while we were doing that day. He usually would leave it up to us if we want to do it pre or post practice. Sometimes there was a post game lift that, you know, the option was again given to do it the next morning. For me, again, all that is communication. The strength coach, the toll that Connor McDavid would have in a game of 24 minutes to the toll that I would take in my eight to 12, it was different. Sure. I, I had different needs again. So the, the stock whiteboard workout wasn't always for everybody. You know, again, 
teams have seemed to adapt it to minute and load certain guys. You know, we'd post the game sheet from the game. You have your minutes up there. If you had X amount of minutes, this is the cardio work you got in to make you whole. If you got a certain amount of minutes, get out of here. You yeah. know, and then, you know, some of the sleep scores and the HRVs for the next morning would, would dictate that. And there's a lot of information, but I, I liked typically to get a, to get a lift in a couple times a week. But if it was a, every other game kind of week, it wouldn't bother me to be off. Sure. So this idea of complementing versus competing, right? Obviously, during the season, you're complementing the game. And the goal there is, is to pull the fire alarm and not to burn the house down. <laughs> right. Yeah. And and I think, again, early in my career, it was, you know, you just worked out because it was on the board. You yeah. had to get through it. And this is what everybody did. And as, you know, science has gotten better and we we've taken a more manageable approach, it seems. You know, not everything's heavy, heavy all the time. Sometimes it's very light and we're trying to move it fast. Yep. And then again, we're, I make fun of strength coaches sometimes because it's like they're scientists. So they're trying to see which program gets the best force plate scores. Maybe at the end of a month, that was pretty hard. Do we lighten? Do we go too much? Do we, because something that's inevitable is the game. The game's going to happen. So what can be adjusted generally is the time in the gym and how hard or how little you do. And they're still learning and still trying to figure out their guys and everybody's a little bit different. So it, it's not an easy job. It's not as easy as putting push-ups and sit-ups on the board and everybody looks good with their shirt off and you go play. That's just, that's just <laughs> not the way it is. <laughs> well put. Flip the script, the script now to the off season, a broad based question. I realized you had a long career, but how did you prepare for the off season? And specifically what seemed to work for you and looking in hindsight, you know, what were some things that you wish you would have changed differently knowing what you know now? Yeah, my worst summers were when I I switched programs. And it wasn't because of, you know, that I didn't like the program. The unfortunate part about pro hockey is sometimes you got to pick your family up and move. School starts in September, we got to get there early. Yeah. And it's it's very difficult to find a gym space. You know, I find it a little bit insulting to go to a different trainer and ask to do a different program. You know, it's like there's there's some hurdles there. It only happened two summers, and I always felt like I came out slow. So me, continuity, belief in the program from start to finish was always probably the most important. You know, I had some summers where I was trying to lighten myself, some summers where I was trying to get more range of motion. The more range of motion, I always got hurt. So I, I hated those summers where I would take yoga classes and try and open up my hips because all of a sudden I had growing surgery, you know, and then you, you can't say that that was because of it, but you know, now that you, you think about it, anytime you gain a range of motion, you should probably try and strengthen the range of motion and you, you tear and stuff and pull and stuff. And at the end of my career, I just decided I'm tight. I'm going to be tight. I'll warm up and I'll just work out. And I did had less soft tissue injuries just kind of accepting that I was, I was tight and, you know, I wasn't going to get big open hips and my stride wasn't all of a sudden going to get super long. So sometimes I, I felt like I was fighting my body a little bit, you know, body comp stuff. That's you can change that. You can change your diet, but sometimes the way you're built and the way you move, uh, I find is just the way you're built. You sure. just, I'm just a tight, small fire hydrant type guy that was never going to be kind of a loose explosive guy. And, uh, I wish I hadn't spent as much time on it as I did. Uh, but I, I wouldn't be saying that if I didn't. So I, it was a lesson. And as a National Hockey League uh, uh, player, uh, you know, when you went back uh, during the course of your career and you were looking for private gyms, what were the qualities that you were looking for in the individual? Well, I, my, I always used my strength coaches from the NHL team as, as a former reference. You know, I, I trust those guys. I've worked with them in the past, so I always asked, who's in the area? Do you know of anybody in the area? Is there anybody that works with players, that's had success with players? And unfortunately or unfortunately, that, that to me is probably the biggest barometer in the industry is mm -hmm. if players work out with you. You know, because for lack, you know, if, if nobody wants to work out with you, there are no pros <laughs> in the area want to work out with you. It's telling. Yeah. You know, like... You know, and that, and to be honest, the story with you, that's how it came up. You know, I did a quick Google search, Ohio hockey, your hockey school actually came up before the gym. <laughs> so I was signing up for hockey school. Uh, but then you, you see that, you, you know, you've worked with pro guys and, you know, I talked to, to killer 
who had recommended you of going out there. So then, you know, I call you and you give it a week. You see what you yep. got. You see what he's all about, and you go from there. You know, and it, it's funny. Some of the uh, you know the big name trainers, I don't know them by name, but they they show up. But a lot of the hockey players will travel to them. I don't know that uh, trainer to trainer things are much different. You know, they might have access to a different facility or you know, or to you know social media cloud or something. But I, I think a lot of it's happenstance. I think sometimes you just the right guy happens to walk into your gym and, and sometimes that guy's name gets attached to a guy. And then, you know, I, I think I could have trained some of the, some of the best players in the world. You just, and mm. so I, I don't know that it's necessarily a fair industry sometimes. So well put in spite of, or because of, eh? like in spite of, or because yeah. of some, some of the best so, players, uh, you, a lot of them could be on terrible programs or just super talented. Right. Or it could be a geography thing. Again, I think that's where communication, education come in and then the belief and the perception of the program, right? And being a part of a culture and being a part of a, I don't know, a family, if that if that makes any sense. Yeah, well, and I remember a situation. We were in Edmonton. We had a Swedish player that had kind of been a tweener. He was really looking to, you know, to progress. And he had seen that, you know, a fellow Swede, I think it was Nick Baxter at the time, was doing basically a summer of no weights. It was just all movement stuff. And so he was going to do the same thing. And he came to camp and <laughs> he didn't have anything. He didn't have it. And yeah. the fact of the matter is Nick Backstrom's probably got more talent in his pinky finger than I got anywhere. And yeah. it didn't matter what he did. He could have sat on his ass and drank Coronas for six months. He probably would have showed up <laughs> and still had 80 assists. Oh, I love you it. Know, so, <laughs> so sometimes when you see what guys are doing, you got to – you know, like it doesn't matter what Connor does in the summer. It doesn't matter. We're never going to look the same on the ice. So you, you got to be smarter than just doing what the big boys do. You know, you, sure. again, I guess there's a draw to that, but I think finding a, a personal fit, the, somebody that's willing to work with you, somebody that's willing to work with your needs, your time constraints, all that kind of stuff, I think is more important than the the branding that goes with the gym you're at. Well put. Shifting gears. So youth hockey, I know it's something that you're very passionate about right now. I mean, it's a broad, it's a, it's a, it's kind of a, a shotgun based question, very broad, but you're a hockey parent. What, what's your advice for young hockey players right now? And, and specifically, you know, players seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years of age, you know, whether it's playing triple A hockey, playing house league hockey, you know, it seems like the game has gotten so much more commercialized and there's more money involved in the game and there's more, there's more practices and there's more games total. There's a lot of noise. How do you separate that signal? Uh, you know, I, again, I'm, I'm a bit of a cynic when it comes to this kind of stuff. You know, I don't think anybody should refer to themselves as a hockey player until they get paid to do it. So, you know, I think you're just a kid that plays hockey, meaning that I, I think you should do a lot of other things. Nobody's a hockey player until, you know, your name's on the check. I, I think you're, you're a kid that plays hockey and you should play baseball and you should go to school and you should go outside and throw rocks at somebody else's property, not mine, but you know, I like do, <laughs> do bad, do, do get be a trouble, kid. Do kid. <laughs> yeah. Go be a kid, you know? So, and I, I try to, to practice what I preach in that sense. You know, my, my kids play hockey. They, play baseball they're into gymnastics they're running around the neighborhood they're chasing the dogs and, and i just think you know and I, I think most parents come from a place of love and they want their their children to do well at these things take it from a guy that never picked up a weight till he was 16 you know i just i did other things i played baseball till i was 18 i was a late bloomer and i got to do a lot of fun stuff as a kid and uh, i didn't have to spend a lot of time in rinks which was nice and i just I, I never stopped loving the game for as long as I was a kid till now. And I think it's because it was never pushed on me. I always got to dictate if I wanted to go to hockey school. I got to dictate just about everything. I wanted to watch the, the Canadians every Saturday night with my dad on the French channel. You know, it wasn't something he sat me down and broke it down for me. We just, we just loved the game. And it was a lot of fun for us. And it, it was never going to be a job. It was just something I did that I was kind of good at. And it eventually became a job. So I, I just think uh, kids got to be kids, have fun and, you know, let them drive the bus. We talk about, well, drive the bus is very interesting too. You know, don't dream on behalf of your kid, right? You know, let, let them mm -hmm. decide. 
this idea too of you know creating a broad base like a pyramid almost you say playing multiple sports you did that i, I mean a lot of players did that in and building out a solid base of athleticism not playing hockey but building out a solid base of athleticism at an early age certainly will only help and not hinder your on ice performance and also probably stops and avoids burnout correct i, I would hope so i would hope so i think there's always I guess, cross-pollination when it comes to sports. There's always something you take from baseball that you can apply to, to hockey, that you can apply to the classroom, that you can apply to dealing with your brother or your sister. Mm-hmm. You know, for me, that's, that's what sports are for, for my family is it's, it's manufactured adversity. You know, if I'm calling the space. I love that, by here, the way. I love that. That's, yeah. that's, that right there is a professor. Manufactured you know? adversity. Wow. I love it. Yeah. Well, I... You know, if I'm calling a spade a spade here, like my, my children have a father that had a very pretty successful NHL career. We live in a beautiful neighborhood. They don't have a lot of hard days, you know, and that's, that's just the reality of it. Sometimes sports, you know, however small or big can, can teach how to lose, you know, how to deal with somebody pushing you around, how to deal with maybe somebody that's saying something in the locker room that you don't like, how to, interject with people, how to work as a team, how to, and I just think it, it has so much value carrying over to life. I think you can learn a lot in sports. They may never play a day in the NHL and that's fine with me as long as they learn how to treat each other and how to be part of something that it's, to me, it's more valuable than any of it. On the flip side, advice for parents, you know, uh, get out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> that's about as, that, that's about as uh, well put as I can, uh, as uh, I can articulate yeah. You know, I think they, they want the best. They really do. And I get it, but there's just, you know, I, I didn't want to, I never wanted to coach my kids. This is my first year I was going to help out. I just like, I like being dad, you know, and I can, you know, it hasn't worked for, I'm sure it's worked for other people, you know, all the, the trainers and the skating coaches and all, you know, the best things money can buy and, and you go after it. And that's, you know, that's each to their own. I think just providing an athlete, that's what we're going to call them, providing an athlete with as much experience as possible in so many other things. I, burnout's such an issue. You know, like I, I know there's some of these kids now that are playing 50 to 60 games and they're, and they're pretty small. It's, I mean, they don't even do that in, in college. You know, so it's, it's, it's bordering on too much. And sometimes they just let them be kids. Let them, uh, let them go scrape their knees. It's it's interesting t- shifting right into my next question, you know, talking about the game schedule. I mean, we're looking at an organizational standpoint. If you're playing AAA hockey, not just in Columbus, anywhere, you're looking at a, approximately anywhere 60 to 65 game schedule. Uh, if you're looking at like a U15, U16, U18 team, you're looking at about including practice games and, 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 and strength and conditioning sessions, you're looking at almost at 180 touch points a year. That's a mini national hockey league season. Contrast that to when you were growing up in Canada. Well, I didn't play triple A hockey. I played, I played travel, but yeah. I had to travel because there was 1400 people in my town. You have yep. to travel to play. There's just not enough kids. Sometimes the, the touch points and the practices and the, I mean, as bad as to say, it may justify the cost sometimes of, uh-huh. of AAA hockey, the way it's run now. You know, there's some big dollars sh- shelled out, and sometimes it, it's paying for ice time, it's paying for coaches, it's paying for a lot of things. So, sure. But more necessarily isn't better. I think the AAA, you know, the U14, U15, we're starting to get into maybe they're deciding they're hockey players, and it, maybe sure. it's not so bad. Yeah. Uh, any earlier than that, I think it's a little bit much. But for me, like I, I didn't play AAA hockey. I got cut from the Western League as a 15 year old and a 60 or 16 and 17 year old. I played tier two junior till I was 21 years old and went to school to be an accountant and turned out a hockey player. So it was never, uh, it was never the goal. It just is something that came along uh, and it was never pushed. So it, it's tough for me to say that my way is the way to do it, but it's, it's what worked for me coming from small town Canada. Just curious, what are your thoughts about? summer hockey, you know, three on three tournaments, uh, tournaments, uh, travel tournaments, et cetera. Do you, do you feel based on your experience that, you know, that's the time for your off season or do you feel like that's the time to continue to refine things for, for young players? Yeah. I think the athlete should always drive it. 
I think if there's a, if there's a true passion for it or, you know, say their winter season got cut short, maybe they had an injury, maybe they had something where you can maybe satisfy the the summer. But I, I don't know, for me, there's a lot of value in going to the lake and skipping rocks and going fishing with your, your dad or your grandpa, or, you know, I think there's, there's something there as well. So for, for me, summer hockey has a place, but it's not something I would push or drive home. I think, you know, you probably able to explain it better than I would, but I feel like we're not meant to be in a skating motion and bent over with hip flexors for 12 months of the year. I think the four months off are valuable. Sure. I, I refer back to my time. My fellow Canadian, I, I was, you know, born in London and, and, um, we moved uh, to the U.S. at the age of 12, but I remember our youth hockey. I vividly remember the season ended, and then our tryouts literally weren't until August, September. I mean, you had literally, you know, four months off. And from a physical standpoint, I, I think specifically with different ages, right? I mean, you, you could view your strength and conditioning coach as a hero. When the athlete's 13 or 14 years old, and you give them four months in the summer, it might have nothing to do with the actual program. Young Tommy might just hit a, a smack dab in the middle of a testosterone surge, right? He might, he might grow four inches in a summer. And now we, we contrast that now, like this is, this is not just in the US, this is in Canada as well, where literally tryouts are two weeks after a hockey season. So those matures don't get the opportunity. And coupled with the fact that they might be totally different hockey players four months down the road if they're refining certain skills. I don't know if that's something that'll ever change now. I think it's too competitive of a landscape. I think there's too much involved from a resource standpoint, from a finance standpoint. But have you seen that shift as well? Do you, have you felt that? Or do you feel there's a reason for it? Or you say, hey, you know, Anth, I, I'd prefer to go back to those days. No, I would love to hear the reasoning for it. And I'm sure somebody has a completely valid one, but I always thought it made sense to to have tryouts right before your team was a team. I just, it made more sense to me. And I don't know, maybe it has something to do with ice time obligations and making sure that financially the, the organization's ready to go move forward. Maybe they're losing athletes because they don't have their tryouts in time. Maybe it gives the opportunity for the kids that played on the team, the best opportunity to make the team the following year. I, I don't know what it is. All I know is it's it's a strange situation, you know, even at the NHL level, we don't make the team and, you know, we get kicked out of the playoffs. We don't make the team the next week. You know, we don't have tryouts and then skate four months together. We we have training camp in September when everybody's had a summer of, of training and growing and then, and then you evaluate. Uh, sure. So again, not everything should be off the NHL model. I feel like those guys know what they're talking about sometimes when they're evaluating and picking teams and the snapshot of right before the team starts to play is probably the best time to pick the talent to play on it. True. Very true. You know, you talked about, you know, we're, we're talking from the grassroots level. Now you're involved in youth coaching. Your boys are involved in, in getting acclimated with a game. You're helping out. What would your angle or advice be to a, a young father who was really interested and in, in, in wants to spend time with his son and wants to get involved in coaching? Obviously, I mean, it's a, it's a catch 22, right? I mean, I, I'm speaking out, out loud here, but this is my opinion. I'd love your, I'd love your, your feedback on it, but these are critical years for young kids to develop. And uh, you want to be able to learn skills appropriately. Yet at the same time, we, we also need help out there on the ice. What can a young coach who doesn't have an experience in the game, is it going to USA hockey lectures? Is it, uh, you know, hitting touch points and, 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 I mean, what advice can you give a young coach at the youth level in trying to help his son or his daughter on the ice and in coaching? Yeah, I think just be present. I think uh, there, there's something to learn all the time. Even in Ohio here, Columbus, you know, the National Hockey League team's been here for 21 years. There are some people, whether it's the Chill or have grown up in Ohio State, there's some good people around the youth hockey programs that are willing to help. I think you just ask questions, but you know, like I, I always go back to, to my own experiences. To me, the most, the mo most of the coaching is done away from the rink. You know, yeah, there's skill stuff, there's skating, there's handling pucks, there's the tactical stuff that comes with, with coaching, you know, the actual 
nuts and bolts, but you know, we've, we've got three rules in my house for my, you know, my kids. And it's, uh, we get a smile, we get a cheer for our teammates and we got to work hard. It's the only three things I care about because I feel like they're controllable. I feel like whether I can do the Zegris pass from behind the net is not something that's totally necessary for an athlete or a person, but I think your attitude and how you treat others and the effort you put into being a part of a team is something that translates from the hockey rink to everywhere else in life. So I think it's just, you you control what you can, you make sure your, your, your little player is respectful and shows up with a good attitude and works hard and they're going to enjoy the hell out of hockey. I can can tell you that because there's a lot of good people on the ice that are, are there willing to help them uh, have as much fun as possible. What's the end goal for Mark Letestu? Uh, do you want to continue? Is the goal to continue elevating in the coaching profession? Is the goal to try to be a, a head coach one day? Is the goal to to scout? Uh, I know you have uh, a tremendous coaching eye, but what's the overall and overarching uh, uh, goal in the game? Yeah, I, I try not to think about it. You know, I'd love to just do this as long as I can. I keep telling everybody, you know, every year it's the best job I ever had. You know, I, I get to be in hockey. Uh, so it's been a lot of fun that way. I thought I was going to be a development coach. Now I'm an assistant coach. You know, who knows what, what next year, or what city, you know, anything. You just, you never know where it goes. But again, you know what I was talking about, how you treat people. It's a very, very small world. And I've tried to treat everybody as respectfully as possible because you never know when the phone's going to ring for an opportunity anywhere. But I love being in hockey. I love being in Ohio. It'd be nice to do this for a long time. Our guest today has been Mark Letestu. Mark. Thanks so much for joining us on the podcast, my friend. Thanks, Ant. Bourbon, let's go.